for Patrick Wright, but not in the studio. How are you, Patrick yeah. Jones? Yeah, good day, guys. Let me um, introduce yeah, you no. properly. Yeah, sure. But you have been? I have, yes. I think, did we have yeah. Meg, your good partner in the yeah. studio, and you on the phone? No, um, the way around. No. I was oh, the other way around. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Well, welcome back to Green the Apocalypse, Mr. Patrick Jones. Uh, Patrick is a writer and uh, artist and community gardener. And last time he was on the show, he was talking about his book, co-authored with his partner Meg Allman, The Art of Free Travel, which is about their exciting and incredible journey, spending very little money and riding bicycles with a tween, a toddler and a terrier up the east coast of Australia the together. They uh, call themselves the family, the artist as family, and they get up to all sorts of things on a permacultural and artistic kind of bent in their hometown of Dalesford in central Victoria. Patrick, we want to talk about all the things you've been up to since you finished your great adventure, and you've got an upcoming talk. We'll mention that later at the Melbourne Free University, um, which sounds very interesting. But let's let's talk about home life at the moment. What what is happening uh, for you guys? Because I know you do some interesting experiments. In fact, are you at this very moment sitting in the darkness? Uh, actually not. Ha <laughs> <No. laughs> busted. No, but you, okay. you, usually, usually I am. Yep. I've um, just uh, escaped the, family, the bustle of family life and candlelight uh-huh. and run over to one of the little tiny houses and I've got um, some mushroom... Uh, papers out here, so if we ended up talking about mushrooms, I can I can actually read it. But um, yeah, oh, yes. this time, Fair. this time of night, we've um, lit a couple of candles. We have a couple of low blue light um, lamps, and that's about all we've got on. Um, so yeah, that whole diurnal um, uh, living with the this, with the the, the our circadian rhythm has become a big story in the last year or so. Oh, we just picked that up on the bikes, really, just um, being exhausted at the end of the day, setting up, finding a camp, really camping, setting up a camp somewhere on dusk and um, getting up and moving on before, um, you know, on sun, sunrise and just living like that for 400 days on 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 that big trip. Um, really, we, we got fantastic sleep and we had incredible energy. I and mean, it's not just, I guess, because we riding every day and getting fitter and moving on um, lots of wild food, lots of fish, um, lots of edible weeds and um, some mushrooms. But yeah, at the moment, um, it's mushroom season up here. And, mm. uh, tell us, tell us more about just sleeping with the seasons first, though. So yeah. just to be clear, you're, you don't use lights in your house? Uh, yes, very, very few lights. Uh-huh. Um, you just occasionally... Can't... Yeah, occasionally we will, um, after the sun goes down, we will put on a little lamp that mm-hmm. we've um, got, which are uh, amber, amber colours, so they have yep. very small amounts of blue light in them. Um, and the, the whole kind of reason of that, um, there's, there's quite a lot of studies to suggest, I mean, this is the science. We, uh, as a species, evolved in the equatorial region, mm-hmm. um, roughly having 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of, um, of dark, um, and uh, for most of human history, we've lived in that. Uh, so we've, we've developed in, in that pattern um, until uh, the advent of the electric light bulb, where um, the daylight, or artificial daylight, has just been incurring, in, uh, um, in, you know, in, um, coming into that twelve hours more and more and more over the last hundred years, and. Um, so researchers at the University of Surrey um, who've been studying um, melatonin production in um, blind or um, vision impaired people um, have found, you know, trying to work out why that community ha- has low rates of um, cancer and yeah. why, um, yeah, lower rates of cancer and why the highest rates are shift workers. Mm. And so there's a theory, this is, you know, uh, this is sort of, under current scrutiny at the moment by a number of different um, researchers. But there is a theory that we're not getting full melatonin production because of the incursion of artificial blue light um, into, uh, into our lives. So that period of time, three hours before bed, um, if you've got like really low levels of um, blue light, um, just a bit of amber light. So obviously we had fires, we had... Um, 
So firelight is mainly amber light, very little blue light. Lunar illumination is not enough to um, apparently uh, stop melatonin production. So that's what mm-hmm. blue light does. It stops the production of melatonin. You can get, like, so, apps for your phone and computer that change the tint on it at night time. Yeah. That's, my, that's yeah. the nearest I've come to that. Yeah. But, so, yeah. but we're in the middle of... Well, we're heading towards uh, solst- winter solstice, mm-hmm. so that's a pretty long night. Yeah. How, how do you guys yeah. cope with that? Just... just um, more organisation, really. So you just you start to think about dinner around five, um, preparing um, the dinner, eating around six, um, bed by seven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, we're keeping you up. Awesome. It's past your bedtime. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but so the last the last bit of that story with melatonin is yeah. that melatonin is one of the um, uh, the, the most powerful antioxidant. Uh, sorry, anti. Um, cancer-fighting hormones that we have in the body. Uh-huh. So, um, and while we're sleeping, um, the melatonin is hoovering up all, all the cancer cells in the body. So that's, that's the general science of it. Now, some people dispute that. Some people, I think it's a crock, but there's, there's just, it's like sort of where the, for me, it's like where the microbiome was 10, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, in terms of... Um, in terms of the general discussion, do you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and now, you know, like it, it feels like it's in its infancy, but I think it will become more and more um, a bigger story uh, in, the, in the next decade. Hey, Patrick, I, I posted a thing recently on fa- I mean, it's ironic that we're talking about um, lo-fi living and stuff, but, you know, we're both Facebook buddies. But there was a thing I put up for you guys to have a look at recently about sleep with Professor Matthew Walker. And uh, a, a lot of what you're saying is echoing what he said and that that idea of um setting your evenings up to be dark um yeah is a very important one i was just gonna wondering as well when when you're out on the road and you were sleeping one of the things he mentioned in that podcast interview was um that you actually sleep better cold um yes and I, i wanted to touch on that because i mean i certainly like to keep our fire sort of gently humming overnight to keep the chill off the house but i've since that in that podcast not even sort of two or three weeks ago i've um returned to sort of sleeping um in minimal clothing with minimal blankets and i'm actually sleeping better and deeper and waking up and exploding out of bed is that something you could speak to a bit yeah i'm finding the same and usually by this time of the year i'm starting uh to close my window and not and not wake up with the kookaburras on on dusk, but um, I'm not only sleeping better with the window open, letting the fire go down after the cooking event at five, six in, in the evening. There's just enough ha- um, heat to keep the house warm for an hour or so while we're still up. And then, um, and then opening the bedroom window and loving that cold, waking up with that coldness, but also not cancelling out bird sounds. So I think, like, waking up with bird sounds is another thing that is just so fantastic for anyone who loves camping. It's just, you know, what that means, um, getting out of your, you know, overly human self and waking up with the call of other animals is just an awesome way to wake up. So, yeah, I, the cold, I, I did listen to that um, that link you sent through and and I I was thinking about that cold it's like we've got a really crudely built um, sauna here that we put in an old um, fireplace uh, from the tip Mm. and uh, some some locally milled um, cedar rough cut cedar and made a little shack and it sweats up we can get up to 90 degrees in there nice chuck some chuck some sauna rocks on the top and um in midwinter when when you're not sweating out your toxins as much um it's it's great for that health wise, but after a sweat, coming outside, pouring a bucket of cold water on you, and then heading to bed is just like you don't get a better sleep than that. Mm, it's very counterintuitive. I, I sort yeah. of thought to myself when I first uh, first heard that that you know that would be like the least pleasant way to shut down for the day is yeah. the cold flush. Um, but it, yeah, it really works. But. Um, yeah, we've got many things to talk about, and I'm, I'm digressing into sleep habits. But uh. So you started bringing up mushrooms, Patrick. So one of the big themes of your book, The Art of Free Travel, was that up and down the coast you guys were living as much as possible off what you could hunt and forage. Yeah. It's mushroom season now. What's happening in your... And I think central Victoria, where you live, is really one of the most biologically diverse places in the world for fungi. What's happening yeah. at the moment? Uh, lots of things. Um, yeah, it's a really great start to the season. 
Um, I've been eating for the first time this uh, year wild anokis. Um, I've got a, a foraging buddy who's just awesome, um, um, Paul Ward or Speedy, mm-hmm. and uh, he, he's put me on to a few really great things of late, um, including eating Amanitas, um, fly agarics. No. Okay, let's be careful here because I think let's these are one of the most know. widely poisoned, yeah. uh, you know, po- yeah, uh, like... Sure. Cause deaths, I, even I think you've I done incorrectly. Jump in! I was just about to jump in with a warning. <laughs> yeah. Please don't, please don't try this at home. It's a really um, long and processed uh, recipe to, to turn this poisonous food into edible food. But so these are um, the red ones with white spots, which the right. um, Vikings would feed to reindeer, then drink the also, urine yeah. in order to get high. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm not making this up, right? <laughs> That's, right. So, so the myth goes. I, I, I don't. Right. I don't know quite if I believe that. But um, okay. yeah, the, the myth, myth goes that um, uh, they extracted the toxins out of the the, the the reindeers. Extracted the toxins. They drank the urine and went into battle in the psychoactive state and mm-hmm. took over. Took over great countries. And, yeah. That's more along the lines and of what I heard. They would enter into. It was where you get the phrase berserker. <laughs> that these Viking, these jo- already gigantic people would enter warfare with their mouths yeah. foaming and <laughs> all sorts of manner. That's good. That's yeah, a good yeah. segue there, Adam, because I'll play some Viking music later. <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying you can eat them, and by detoxifying, you're also getting rid of the psychoactives, are you? That's right. Yeah, you are. Yeah, and they're not just... Look, they're, I'm, I'm interested in any food that's feral or weed or abundant and dominant, and i just getting away from this 1080 roundup culture of ours that, that's so violent and fascistic in its conservation mm. and getting much more into compassionate conservation and um, saying, well, most, most species... I mean, we can get biological controls to this. We don't have to fork out money to coals and woolies. You know, 10% of our diets could easily be, or 5 to 10, 15% of our diets could come from wild uh, ferals and, um, and weeds. And it's just it's an abundance out there, uh, particularly in central Victoria, but, you know, I have foraged in Melbourne as well. Mm. Um, so uh, fly agarics, you know, again, they're poisonous. If you just chuck them in the pan with some butter, you're going to be sick. Um, so don't do that, but there is there is a process in in, 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 in which to convert that into food. Um, One so, that doesn't involve reindeer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've been eating um, indigenous rooting shanks this year. Of course, the slurpy jacks and saffron milk, milk caps, um, wood bluets and uh, field bluets. Um, very bitter Australian honey fungus, which is a really dominant um, forest blight around here because of poor forest management. Oh, I didn't know you could eat that. Yeah, it's really bitter. Yeah. Um, and so I boil the water, change the water. I boil them in water, change the water but, but two or three times and then cook them up. You still get... I mean, I, I, we don't have enough bitterness in our diets, as you'd know, Grubby. Um, you know, but the more bitter foods we actually get into our diets, the less cravings for sugar. And, and the same the same happens in reverse. The more sugary our diet, the less desirable we find bitter food. So if you've got cravings for sugar and you want to allay those, um, go and start munching on dandelion leaves um, on a regular basis and build an appetite for, um, for bitterness. And that will, like what Bushy was talking about with um, beer and running, you know, once you attend to a sort of a craving or a desire, um, something else happened that says yes to other things. And so I love bitter foods. Mm. That's a fair point, yeah. actually. Uh, should we keep going, Egg, or do you want to go to our first track for the night and then come back? Yeah, let's go to a track. It yep. seems in a good break. But we should remind everybody that if you're going to eat fungi, you can poison yourself quite easily. Just Is there anybody, that you, courses or anything you recommend, Patrick? Oh, and I also understand that you're doing mushroom policing at the local market, with, as in yes. doing ID work. Yep. Absolutely. And look, the most common mushroom Victorians end up in hospital is the field mushroom, uh, field mushroom lookalike, which is Xanthodermis. It's a yellow staining mushroom. It's, it's a dominant species, more dominant than the field mushroom. So I just say stick away from field mushroom looking like mushrooms. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, but yeah, I'm the, the local fungi ID guy at the local markets every week. And so people have been bringing in and having really great conversations about, um, Edibility and how to identify. And Alice's family, we're going to be running a couple of courses coming up. So if you're interested, you can follow us on social media at Alice's family and we'll advertise those courses. Awesome. You are indeed. And we have on the phone 
we have uh, Patrick Jones, who is, well, one of the factions, let's say, <laughs> one of the one of the, one of the co-collaborators within Artist's family, and we've been talking about the kind of. Um, yeah, well, interesting parts of your lifestyle, which seem partly inspired by your fantastical journey up the East Coast on bicycles, which included sleeping with the sun, or when it's gone. <laughs> It'd be weird to do it the wrong Sleeping with its absence. Yeah, not the vampire method, the opposite. And uh, continuing on with things like um, getting a lot of food from wild feral forage stuff. You're doing a few other projects? Do, do you feel like... Um, I, well... Actually, one thing that I thought was interesting, and it could be a segue into other discussions, is that you've had a bit of a. Uh, you, you've been, I saw on Facebook a lot of shares for something called Peasant Insurrection Chess. What's that? <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, about a month ago, Woody, our five year old, said, uh, asked me to teach him uh, chess, to play chess, and I sort of had a few days to think about it. We couldn't do it straight away, so um, I was just thinking, I don't want to tell him that story. I don't want to. I don't want him growing up with that story of those little pawns at the front and uh, and the royalty all sort of making the shots and and it all being a, a, about the aristocrats. Uh, I mean, obviously in feudal times, but today you can, you know, it's uh, I guess um, the, the corporate bosses um, or, ca- or capitalists. Um, I, I want to I want to tell a new narrative. So I, being a chess player, I started putting um, I started uh, setting the the board up in just by myself, and I came up with what I call peasant insurrection chess, and I shared it. I, I was in Melbourne a few weeks ago. Um, just I was walking to the State Library to do some work there, just as the uh, librarian came out with all the, the big chess pieces that sit out the front of the library, and uh, I helped her unload it. <laughs> and I thought, fuck it, I've got to set this up. So I set it up as a game of present instruction chess is set up, and I uh, took a photo, and then um, we did a post on Artists' Family Facebook uh, and Instagram um, explaining the rules, and it's just going completely nuts and people are are discussing um moves that they've made how to like there's a there's a there's a a a lot of the all the 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 so-called pawns i call peasants have the same moves and it's the pet black and white peasants at either end of the board are um the attempt is well one one player plays for the peasants one for the aristocrats and um, it's a very it's hard it's a, you have to be a great chess player I think to win on the peasant side but it's not impossible yeah. and so um, yeah so that's a funny little thing and so Woody and I now play that at home that's I, how it goes I heard a great Italian saying the other day Patrick for Woody is um, the king and the pawn go back into the same box yeah right no. <laughs> yeah yeah I like that they sleep together yeah they do indeed yeah that's a great picture. I'm just, I just noticed, though, actually, the picture we've got here of your game of insurrection chess set up in the city. There's three police officers in the background. Is that anything to do with your... <laughs> and a row of children in front of them. Yeah, and a row of children well, blocking the cops. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the other beautiful moment of that image. So just as I was setting up, these school kids came along with their teachers and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm setting up the peasant insurrection chess. And the, and the kids go, can we play? And, uh, <laughs> but instead of playing the game, they just start, started to take over the state immediately. <laughs> exactly. Wow. And then the police presence was there, and it was just such a nice coincidence of timing because I'm setting this up, peasant insurrection chess, just as the massive um, union march is coming down past the library. And so there was a police presence there because of that. So I I, uh, I didn't know the march was on at the time, but um, I was definitely in um, in uh, solidarity with <laughs> just doing a, a completely uh, different kind of activity. So you have an interesting relationship with this word peasant. You, you describe your activities and those of your family as that of a neo-peasant what, 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 what's that mean to you? Because, it, you know, I can see it could get the hackles up. Like, are you celebrating um, an, era, an, an, an era where, you know, it was pretty hard to be upwardly mobile and that you uh, were bound to this land-based existence and, and to the whims of those aristocrats above you? Sure. Yeah, look, there's lots of um, there's lots of reductionist history around peasants, um, and I guess over the last 
several years I've been reading about my own um, ancestral peasantry. And there's, of course, peasants still uh, in many cultures still living and operating as peasants. So, you know, I am, I am definitely, in neo-peasant, I'm basically acknowledging um, a middle-class privilege to call myself that. So the neo is just basically saying my grandparents were working Australians um, a few, about three or four generations before them, they were uh, land-based peasant cultures. Um, my parents were became middle class because of my, the, the, you know, the sweat and availability of crude oil, but the sweat of my grandparents and then, you know, my parents became middle class and then I second second middle class generation in Australia. So I but I'm I'm looking environmentally and culturally at this. I'm saying who are my ancestors? I live on Jajurong land. Jajurong economy and culture is the only example of ecological economy that we have on this land. I can't appropriate that. I can honour it and respect it and listen uh, to the elders um, who speak that, but it's not my culture to tell. But what I do have is a historical link, a very um, one that was still living in my grandmother when she used to tell us kids to let a healthy dog lick our wounds. This is terrain theory, really. Um, uh, from, you know, this is... This is uh, Peasant health. This is like my my indigenous ancestry comes through that last little remnant of um, uh, dog kin um, collaborations with humans. Um, I'm getting a, getting a bit lost here, but look, carbon. The only carbon positive relative or, or uh, relos I have are back in feudal England. Um, the enclosures in England started in about the 12th century. Um, they worked their way up, and by the 18th century, when the, um, the likes of Adam Smith start kicking in and cap the early capitalists start to take the power over from the old lords and the feudal system, um, the Enclosure Act comes in at, in 1773, um, Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations is published in 1776 and Australia gets a whole bunch of dumped um, uh, convicts who were um, often uh, often um, incarcerated for things like the game laws that the early um, uh, the classical political economists uh, uh, sort of um, advocated for and made sure that people in the land in country who had access to being able to grow their own food or being community sufficient or self-sufficient in some way um, could not um, enact an autonomous economy. So I'm not talking about the usual um, re reference to peasants, which are just like dumb, stupid people from the country, but... Um, uh, I think George Monbiot says the, the oddest insult in the English language is when you call someone a peasant mm. because you're basically looking at people who um, can be self-provisioning and community provisioning um, and who, you know, have an enormous amount of skills and work with um, ecologies in order to provide that. They don't... Um, th yeah. They're, so I guess it's a really... Um, there's ancestry to me, there's the story, there's carbon positive um, drawings on mostly non-monetary. Um, there's, a, there's a closeness to the commons or non-privatised lands. Uh, there's diurnal intelligence and the origins, of course, of food. So um, food and energy resources being, you know, the driving... Um, the way in which we do food and energy resources are the, is, is the... It, you know, it, it's a climate change story, really. Um, uh, industrial food and energy systems are basically equate to climate change. So, yeah. I, I so I mean, I, I definitely feel sy sympathy towards the idea that um, people that had to live off the land, especially if it was old cultures and you're talking village lifestyles, that they could have had some pretty happy existence and managed managed to do that with, as you put it, a carbon positive footprint. So. Uh, maybe they captured more carbon in the soil than, than they extracted from it and from the forest yeah. that they burnt. They may have grown, you know, kept that... So for, from a... If, if you take, you know, a kind of environment, environmentalist, moralist perspective, um, then they, they live a more sustainable life than ours and they're not hurting the ecology and future generations. But there's... 
I, feel, I also feel a lot of resistance that maybe throwing out um, everything that's come... <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm quite ready to go back yeah. uh, to that yeah. lifestyle. I don't know if many people would be or, or could with yeah. current population. I guess, I guess for us, it's we're, we're trying to conceive of um, a really low-carbon um, life form. I mean, that's our whole sort of practice up here. Like, how, how do we... How do we uh, live with extremely low levels of carbon that is not going to cost the earth in the way it is? But, I mean, the cultural stuff, Joan Thirsk is an agricultural historian, and in 1978 she uh, wrote an incredible book on peasants um, pre-classical uh, political economy. And while the enclosures did start in the 12th century, there were still people that were able to um, augment their own culture. They were they were self determining in many respects. And she writes that in the 16th and early 17th century, about one third of the working days, including Sundays, were spent in leisure. And um, festivals nice. celebrated. Yeah, I mean, like that's just unheard of. So yeah. you know, this is when you go into the history. Um, I mean, the usual thing is um, is that. This is misery. This is this is um, misogynistic, miserable culture. Well, actually, that happened once peasants were dispossessed. Just like anyone is dispossessed, just just like any culture is dispossessed, it, people become traumatic, traumatized, so tra- traumatized, and um, and so things become ugly in cultures, whether they be human or non-human. When when um, when there's great um, sort of displacement. So, um, you know, the, the, but the story um, pre that trauma uh, is the story that I'm interested in, because, mainly because I, I don't really believe in endless amounts of energy. I no. don't believe that, that, you know, so if, if we're not going to have... So this is pragmatic. I don't see it as moral at all, what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm just seeing it as pragmatic adaptation. Like, how do we, how do we configure... How do we live well? How do we live with a third, third of the year in um, leisure, you know, in, in cultural making leisure um, times. Like, you know, people are time poor. People, you know, just, just like chasing the man. Um, just chasing the man. You're just like chasing the tails to pay the man. Um, mm. It's like a big, big story. And I, I, knew, I know that story. I, I hate, I hated my life when I was that. So becoming... Um, increasingly non-monetary. Um, obviously, having access to a quarter acre in the in the outer burbs of Dalesford has it has enabled a very different type of economy to be made. And having that access is extremely privileged. So, so you're obviously getting more sleep. Are you actually finding <laughs> more time to for for that relaxation? And is that directly because you're providing for? some of your own needs, like doing more repair work, doing more community gardening and gardening yeah. for food and yeah. stuff. Is, 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 is it actually working out on balance? Because a lot of those things, I know, they, they do take time as well. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's been 10 years and we started 100% dependent on the monetary economy and we, we estimate we're now 30% um, um, dependent on it. So it's... So you mean uh, like you work for thirty percent and pay for it with money for your clothes, food, shelter, etc., and the other seventy percent you're providing yeah. through informal economies and foraging that's and right. all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. So thirty percent is monetary. Yeah. So um, that's pretty much mortgage, basically. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so so and that with that so we've got this we have this principle that we only spend money on stuff that's going to enable us to become more moneyless. And so obviously having access to land, but also doing community gardening and gorilla managed forest free work, knowing 30 different um, wild edible mushrooms, 50 different um, edible weeds, that all contributes to being, you know, each each summer better and better food, um, veggie growers. The gift of I just felt the competitive to- side of me count how many I know. <laughs> you might be outdoing me. I'll send you my list. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I, I think, you know, the other thing that, that I really don't like um, 
like like any a, a kind of permaculture or even even to, to talk about peasants in terms of self sufficiency. I hate that term. It's really right wing. It's always community sufficiency that makes people resilient. Yeah. And so being in a, a really tenacious gift economy up here, um, lots of um, exchanging of goods. I can't remember. I mean, we so buy- Patrick, we got to go to a track. That is a good place to leave it. Let's uh, stick on the phone, and uh, we're about to hear from. Oh, do remind me, Jed. Oh, it's Brian Eno. Brian Eno. Can't remember. Patrick Jones on the phone from up in central Victoria. We've been chatting about all sorts of uh, aspects of his life, including reinventing chess to be um, a good outcome for the peasants and some, a lot of the fungi ID. Well, it and... sounds like you set them up to fail if they lose most times. <laughs> well, I don't think so. We had a chat at the top of the show about um, sleeping with the seasons and sleeping, you know, well, not with the sun, but against the sun. And we are just chatting beforehand um, about the, some of the ideas behind what Patrick and Meg and the crew have deemed, uh, dubbed neo-peasantry. There was this old poem, though, Patrick, you touched on the Enclosures Act before we went to that track, and there's this old poem that I I remember, and it vaguely goes along the lines of um, the law locks up the man or woman that takes the goose from off the common, but lets mm. the greater villain loose that takes the common from the goose. Mm. And that was a... I can't remember where I read that, but it, was, it touched on the Enclosures Act. Now, I can't remember where you read it. Did you just recite that? Yeah, yeah, just huh. recited it. it. Um, but that... That speaks to the idea of uh, the commons and the uses of public land, and I just wanted to maybe chat to you guys a bit about your experiences of moving sort of out beyond um, your little quarter-acre patch and and shared places with friends and out into the public lands and and open lands around the area and and how that goes and some of the responses you get from other people and and even to touch on how others' interactions with that land might affect you. I know a year or two back Adam was interviewed when uh, he was kicking back against glyphosate being sprayed on his lunch in one of the local Brunswick parks. No, it wasn't glyphosate. They were doing broadleaf broad, herbicide broad application herbicide. off the back of a tractor across the whole park, which, yeah, That's technically, you, you spo- it says on the back of the pack, no one's supposed to go on the park for three days. But That's right, yeah. But they didn't yeah. I thought it wasn't. Probably the, the Brunswick East mums <laughs> would, would like to know about that. <laughs> oh, but there was, they... incidentally, yeah, killing my dandelion, which I wasn't too happy about. Well, that's right, and, and it yeah. spoke volumes yeah. about um, how various different people, stakeholders, interests interact with piece of land. And so I guess, Patrick, how, how was your experience um, moving out into the public sphere and, and, and foraging and harvesting bits and pieces of mm. what may fall? How does that go? Yeah, well, as, as Adam, you'd know, um, teaching foraging is, is, is often not just about plants and mushrooms, but actually um, teaching people where, how to identify where um, herbicide drifts have, have, would most likely occur in a, in a public space and, uh, you know, look, looking for where heavy metals might sit in an in environment and things like that. So it's, it's as, as much to do with um, food as it is the, the, uh, the environmental pollutants. But I'm just thinking how well we're selling the, your, the lifestyle so far. So we've got <laughs> throw cold water over yourself in the middle of the night before going to bed, um, yep. eat while food from possibly lead-contaminated soils. <laughs> what else we... <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's, let's move on to the next thing. Um, Maybe you yeah. need to touch on the raw milk and the raw start sex. A, so. Start a chess game that yeah, you probably right. won't win. <laughs> Just stack it against yourself. Yeah, see, I've never been good at... I never make it in advertising. <laughs> um, yeah, after, but, the, after we talk about the commons, you might have to talk about mead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so... Yeah, we, we started uh, getting really serious about uh, the little forest. So we're at the suburbia sort of ends in south west Dalesford, and then we walk down this sort of little green place, uh, green path past a, a neighbour's orchard, and then we're in um, like this sort of novelty remnant forest, um, not quite uh, the Wombat State Forest, but uh, sort of like a, a, a reserve that um, feeds down to the back of Lake Dalesford. And there's um, about every four or five years, the CFA and other land managers would just set fire to it because it's full of non-correct species. And um, <laughs> What do you mean by that? Uh, basically non-Indigenous species. Yeah. Um, so, and then that what would happen in that uh, is uh, a massive weed event would, would then um, bracken and, uh, sorry, uh, uh, gorse and scotch broom and blackberries would just, uh, you know, start start their succession.
question again. So it, it is a sad irony, and I talk about it on the edible weed walks I do, uh, that herbicide spray and fire does the same thing, where it takes things back to bare earth and full yeah. sun, and yeah. that are the conditions that the plants we call weeds are adapted to for the most part. It's the reason why they follow us all around the world, because we're very good at doing those exactly. things. Exactly. As soon as you disturb soil, you've got weeds. Yeah. Um, it's as simple as that. So this, this forest was uh, absolutely ravaged by gold lust in the, in the 1850s, um, so gold digging town. Um, and then blackberries have basically been stabilising um, steep gully banks ever since, um, you know, because it was completely denuded. So what we've been doing is a whole range of things, um, recognising that we need to stop the burning regimes. We've, we've stopped the herbicide regimes. Um, we, this, is, this forest is about 10 acres, and we've been doing community, I guess, guerrilla um, forest management of it. And So was it traditionally burnt? Uh, no, no. Okay. Not, no, not, not. Whereas a lot of his, um, the, the Australian continent was, but not this yeah, type um, of forest. So, no, and look, uh, indigenous burning, as far as I'm aware, happens in mosaic, um, um, uh, small mosaic pattern burning um, up in um, the north of the country. Down here, the burning, as far as I'm aware, were like after the the grain um, and the Murnyong, um so in, in the perennial grasslands where Chajarong agrarianism was taking place, um, just very uh, timely, um, well-placed um, small burns. But mm -hmm. this is um, damp, uh, wet forest. It would have been tree ferns originally. There would have been, um, yeah, very fire-retarding um, mm -hmm. forests. So, so what we're trying to do is get it back to... Um, uh, well, basically, stop the, the burning regimes, and uh, so what we do is chop and drop. So using t permaculture techniques, I learned from David Hongren years ago that he permaculture was, co-originator and future guest of the show yeah. in two weeks, I think. Ah, uh, fantastic! Yep, talking all things retrospective birdie and no doubt. Yes. Um, yeah, so he was uh, he and, and our fellow community participants were using ladders like uh, light. Um, uh, aluminium ladders to lay down across the blackberries and so we started using boards and getting teenagers involved and calling it blackberry surfing and so we, we inlanders are at, you know there's not much surf up here so going down the <laughs> gullies with teenagers, getting dumped uh, sounds pretty yeah, full on exactly <laughs> getting dumped so you're talking uh, about you're, sort of, you're on top of a big because they can grow like several meters deep the um the blackberry canes can't they so it's just living layer on top and then it's all dead underneath which becomes a fire hazard exactly it's ext the canes are extremely fire hazard it's after three years of doing this of laying them down once a year so you can do a tennis court and with two teenagers with a couple of boards um can do a tennis court size in about 20 minutes half an hour uh -huh. um and you know there's there's li literally two footy grounds worth uh, we've done over the last three years. And in the third crushing, um, it, this latest crushing, they're not... So it's, it's using blackberries as a living mulch. They're extremely good. Like, the, the wood is lignin-rich, um, so it's great for soil building. You get the, 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 the canes down on the ground and they start rotting over, over winter, mm. turn into soil, then we start planting in. To that, to it sounds that. like a so, classic example of the permaculture adage slash cliche. The problem is the solution. Yep. Where you see, yeah, the, the blackberries is this like uh, horrible invasive species. It's also fire um, causing, and um, yeah, I've seen this in action. And what you've been up to there, and what Dave has been, yeah. David and Sue have been doing there. And uh, yeah. but what do you want? Can you explain how? Because just squashing. Blackberries down to the ground doesn't seem like that's going to kill them. What what is the stage of it, uh, yeah, it, getting the intention rid of them? Is to take, the, the, the first intention is to take the fire proneness out of them, which is what we've done. So we um, and then um, so just squashing the, them does that because it's not like a big it, pile of tinder does, with air through it. It 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 it, it turns the, the squ squashing uh, the, the crushing turns them from fire prone into fire retarding. So they become this green living um, forest floor mulch. Um, and 
basically the they're only dominant there because the keep getting um, uh, uh, the, the solar keeps getting disturbed every four or five years through the burning, um, and they're sunny. So mm. the next stage is to plant into them. So this is not the mentality of let's get rid of every skerrick of blackbird. Black, there's so many indigenous um, animals that uh, have been incorporating blackberry um, into their diet for probably 150 years or more now. Mm. So, um, yeah, Tim Lowe's The New that. Nature, I think, yeah. looks into that and some other shrubby species, prickly species yeah. that end up like being the last remaining habitats of some endangered yeah, exactly. native animals. Yeah, I've got nativist friends or, or naturalist friends, I should say, who are, um, who are telling me that a certain type of gorse is being um, earmarked not, not for removal in a certain area because of a very endangered small um, thornbill or finch or mm-hmm. some small bird is, you know, it's its dominant habitat. That's the other thing that led us to, with observation um, in this forest is that the hawthorns that are there that have no ecological status are now the dominant um, habitat tree for ringtail possums to build their drays in. Okay. So, I'm not sure if every, all of our urban listeners would know hawthorn. It's like a, it's like a, it's a hedgerow uh, plant. Yeah, from, hedgerow. from Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah from all over actually. Um, uh, okay. Europe, um, North Africa, uh, Asia. Um, extremely great medicinal berries. Um, heart medicine in China. Mm. Um, our ancestors from my ancestors from um, England used um, them way before um, agrarian settlements. Um, as uh, an ethnobotanist, um, this is a theory uh, that they were made as fruit leathers because they've got high amounts of vitamin C. Oh yeah, you can eat the berries. That's right, yeah. yeah. But if you turn, turn them into fruit labels, they're really desirable and you can turn them into really... Uh, they've got high levels of pectin. So, um, uh, yeah, so that for making uh, fruit jerky, to, which is light, and uh, you can chew on through the winter and um, you've got this sort of uh, availability of, of good uh, nutrition to get you through the winter. So um, they're, for me, old ancestral medicine t- trees, um, living... Um, as as a main habitat um, for uh, old timer ringtail species, uh, yeah. ringtail possums, and so there's a there's a pragmatic mutualism in in the ad- adaptation there. So the the red uh, squirrel would have been the traditional mammal that lived in hawthorn or is in mm. and um, and now it's a ringtail possum, and so the possum gives nutrients to the tree. The tree's thorns protect the possum from powerful owls. Hey Patrick, we seem, I think we're keeping you up a bit past your bedtime, aren't we? Um, <laughs> we will have to wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, we're also, also conscious of the fact that we do have to go off air at eight, eight o'clock. But both those things sure. are important to me. Um, sure, sure. Well, uh, we went down some pathways there that I didn't really expect to go, but I think that's really fascinating. That I, uh, you know, the idea of mixed ecologies and novel ecosystems, and then. Yeah, recognising that there are native animal, non, uh, non-Indigenous non plant synergies and where you do want to control them, see if there is a use for them in uh, in terms of eating them like in the hawthorn or using them as tree guards and living mulches in the blackberries. So, mm. I don't know, it's a fascinating topic. Um, we'll put some info up on Facebook about the talk and we'll, we'll give it a shout-out at the end. Yeah, we'll give it a shout-out at the end. Is there anything that you want to... So, you're giving a, a, a talk... Um, on May the twenty yep. fourth, which is yep. in two days, for yep. the Melbourne Free University, can you yep. tell us quickly just uh, what you're going to yep. be talking about there? Sure. The title of it is called Permacultural Neo Peasantry and the Birds: Cultural Appropriation or Carbon Positive Reclamation. Um, it's on at seven o'clock at the Alderman upstairs, one hundred and thirty four Ligon Street, East Brunswick. It's a forty five minute. Um, uh, conversation and then followed by a 45 minute open discussion um, and it's hosted by the wonderful melbournefreeuniversity.org so um, yeah come along if you are interested in all things permacultural and future economies and alternative economies awesome um, we will thank you very much for your time this evening, Patrick. I am going to quickly play a tune to take us out of the show. It, it's not a peasant theme song. It's a Viking song by Amon Amath, and it's, the title is Twilight of the Thunder God, their album of the sun.